the idea of systemic racism is not that people are operating with a racist mindset or racist intention. It's that it is a system that was originally designed to produce racist outcomes, and it is continuing to produce them regardless of the intent of people within that system. Through policing, through prosecution, through incarceration, the criminal justice system has produced massive declines in crime since the 1990s. And those declines have endured primarily to the benefit of black and brown communities across the country. Is there overwhelming evidence that America's criminal justice system is racist? That was the subject of an online Soho Forum debate held on Wednesday, June 24th, 2020, sponsored by Reason. Arguing that America's criminal justice system is in fact racist was Radley Balco, an opinion writer for the Washington Post. A former senior editor at Reason, Balco is also the author of the books Rise of the Warrior Cop and the cadaver king and the country dentist. Defending America's criminal justice system against the charge of racism was the Manhattan Institute's Raphael Manguel, who is also a contributing editor for City Journal. Here's Radley Balco versus Raphael Manguel in an online debate moderated by Soho Forum director, Gene Epstein. Tonight's resolution reads, there is overwhelming evidence that the criminal justice system is racist. Speaking for the affirmative, Radley Balco, journalist at the Washington Post. Speaking for the negative, Raphael Mangual, deputy director of legal policy at the Manhattan Institute. Uh, When each of you has five minutes and one minute remaining in your allotted time, I'll be briefly interrupting to inform you. Uh, Jane, please close the initial vote. Defending the resolution, Radley Balco. Radley, you have 17 and a half minutes allotted to you. You can take it all or you can fall short. Either way, I'll keep time. Uh, Radley, take it away. Thanks, and thanks for uh, thinking of me and inviting to participate in this. Um, Just last week, Theodore Johnson, a a black conservative, wrote at National Review uh, about his experiences with racial profiling by police. He noted the fact that over the course of his life, he'd been pulled over more than 40 times, uh, including one time that unjustly landed him in jail. Uh, He noted that he has black friends and family members who had had similar experiences. Tim Scott, the conservative uh, black uh, senator from South Carolina, several years on the floor of the U.S. Senate, uh, talked about his own experiences with racial profiling and how he had been unjustly pulled over. In fact, noted that his chief of staff had... um, uh, started driving a less expensive car because he'd been pulled over because police uh, officers had mistaken him for a drug dealer because he was a black man driving an expensive car. Um, when I talk to racism about racism in the criminal justice system, I like to ask conservatives, do you think people like Tim Scott and Theodore Johnson are lying? Do you think that they're making these stories up? Um, and I would guess that most would say no. Uh, and then I would ask if you don't believe them, uh, or if you do believe them, excuse me, why do you believe them but not the countless uh, other black people who have told, about, uh, told us about similar experiences or have spoken up about similar experiences. The evidence of system, systemic racism in our criminal justice system isn't just persuasive, it's overwhelming. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've been collecting studies, surveys, and reports on this matter, and I've collected a uh, catalog close to 300 now, which you, which you can find at the Washington Post. The ratio of studies, surveys, and reports that have found racial disparities to those that haven't uh, is about 25 to 1. These studies show racially disparate outcomes in police stops, police searches, how bail is administered, who gets arrested, uh, who gets pulled over, who gets fined, who gets arrested for not paying fines, who gets charged for possessing drugs, who gets leniency when prosecutors offer plea bargains, who gets leniency when judges issue sentences, who gets parole or probation, who gets hit with technical violations while on parole, parole or probation, which kids get cited or arrested when cops work in schools, who gets picked for juries, who gets put in solitary confinement, on whom cops use force, how much force they use, who gets the death penalty, who cops kill, and who gets commutations and pardons. Um, None of this should really be surprising. Um, The criminal justice system was uh, designed, honed, and evolved during the Jim Crow era. And there's plenty of historical evidence, a a, a deluge of historical evidence showing that for most, much of the Jim Crow era, the criminal justice system was designed to preserve uh, the racial hierarchy that, we, that that existed during Jim Crow. That is, it was designed to sort of keep black people in their place. Um, I don't think anyone uh, listening to this debate would deny that the Jim Crow era existed, that there was racial segregation during that era, uh, and that our institutions existed to sort of perpetuate uh, that segregation. 
The fact is, though, those those institutions survive Jim Crow. They, the Jim Crow is, is gone, uh, but those those institutions survive. And the idea that institutions that were built and designed to preserve racial hierarchy would suddenly stop doing that just because Jim Crow went away, I think, defies credulity. Um, when we talk about systemic racism, I think people mis mistakenly think that systemic racism, th the charge of systemic racism means that every single person in the criminal justice system is racist. Uh, that is not what systemic racism means. Systemic racism means that we have a system that was designed uh, to, to uh, perpetuate racially disparate outcomes uh, and continues to do so. Um, the example I like to give is St. Louis County, Missouri. Uh, shortly after the Ferguson protests began, I went to St. Louis County, Missouri to do some reporting, and I went to all the county, uh, excuse me, a lot of cities other than Ferguson in St. Louis County. Well, St. Louis County has an ungodly number of cities. Over 90 municipalities exist in this one county, uh, and there's a reason for that. Um, back in the, uh, the mid-20th century, when white people started fleeing St. Louis, uh, they would flee St. Louis, and they would move out into the county. Black people uh, would then the black middle class would then start also moving into the county also to get out of the city and white people would sort of pick up and move a mile or a half mile over and start a new city. Uh, basically, it was a, this, this perpetual pattern of white people sort of picking up and moving as black people moved into their neighborhoods. And this created what, what was locally called the uh, postage stamp cities all over St. Louis County. And those exist today. Um, the problem is each of these little cities has its own police department and its own city council and they all have to draw a salary. And in St. Louis County, the primary source of revenue for these municipalities are fines and fees uh, administered by municipal courts. These are things for things like traffic violations, for jaywalking, for uh, exceeding occupancy permits and houses. Uh, and what I found when I went there is if you talk to, to people who live in, in black areas of St. Louis County, um, they are perpetually harassed by cops because the police officers, and there's plenty of evidence of this, are basically told by their city councils to treat the people who live in these cities as, as ATM machines for the city. In fact, these municipal cops don't really solve crimes. The, the, if there's a serious crime, it's handled by the county police. These city cops exist solely to uh, shake people down uh, to provide revenue for their local towns and cities. And the, the, well, the part where the systemic racism comes in here is that the primary source of revenue in St. Louis County for a municipality is a, a sales tax. Well, the poorer a city is, the less money it's going to get from a sales tax, right? And of course, there is a correlation between poverty and, and the percentage of a county that is black. And so what we actually find is that the blacker some of these cities are, the more reliant they are on fines and fees for revenue. That is, the more likely it is that their police officers are shaking down their residents uh, for, with these, these you know, excessive fines and fees. Um, we found some, count, some cities in St. Louis County where there, there had been uh, 20, even 30 arrest warrants issued for every resident of the county, because if you can't pay these and you can't get to court, then you get an arrest warrant issued for you. Um, talking to people who live in these counties, th this was overwhelming. These people, you know, people who lived in some of these towns had multiple arrest warrants. They were scared every time they went out in their car. Um, and this was a system that was designed sort of to, uh, to, 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 to not only to shake people down, but also to the, 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 the blacker a city was, the more reliant it was on these fines and fees. And so you, have, you could have a system where basically a city in St. Louis County may have a black city council. It may have a majority black police department, but it was more reliant on fines and fees than wealthier cities. And therefore, uh, those officers were going to be more harassing of the residents of those towns. Um, and so you could have a system where none of the people who operated within that system were necessarily racist. A lot of them were black themselves. But this was a system that, that had a, a racially disparate outcome that preyed on black residents more than white residents. And that was the result and the direct product of, uh, of historical sort of racism. It was a legacy of this system of white people sort of fleeing St. Louis as a city. Um, that's one example. But you can see similar examples all over the country in sort of how these systems, how, how black neighborhoods are policed versus white neighborhoods um, and how uh, black neighborhoods have you know, historically been broken up. Um, you can find this sort of across all various aspects of our society, but you see it most pronounced in policing in the criminal justice system. So let's look at the data. Um, I'm going to go, I can't obviously go through all 300 or so studies that I've looked at over the last couple of years, but I can give you some highlights. So just last May, there was a massive study of 95 million traffic stops by 56 police agencies in the United States between 2011 and 2018. This study found that black motorists are far more likely to be pulled over than white motorists. But interestingly, 
uh, as the day grew darker, the time of day grew darker, uh, the discrepancy narrowed, suggesting that when police couldn't actually see the race of the drivers, they were less likely to racially profile. And that's a pretty good indication that these stops weren't necessarily based on merit, but that race was a, 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 a driving factor in why peace, police were pulling people over. The study also found that black people were far more likely to be searched after a stop even though the searches of white people were more likely to find contraband. Now, this last part is important, and it's consistent with countless other studies we've seen of traffic stops. Nearly every study to look at traffic stops and searches has found that black people are more likely to be searched by police, and also that white people, searches of white people are more likely to turn up illicit drugs or weapons. Um, we've seen this in studies of, of stops in Cincinnati, Austin, Washington, D.C., Southern California, Connecticut, Springfield, Missouri, Burlington, Vermont, the entire state of Vermont, North Carolina, St. Louis County, the list goes on and on and on. Um, let's move to the drug war. Study after study has shown that though, though blacks and whites both use and distribute drugs at similar rates, black people are far more likely to be arrested, charged, and convicted, and to get more jail time once they are convicted. In New York City, black people are eight times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession, and in Manhattan, it's 15 times more likely. Over the rest of the country, it ranges from slightly more likely to 40 or 50 times more likely. And here, uh, one really interesting example, uh, a few years ago, Harris County, Tennessee, the, the home of, or excuse me, Harris County, Texas, the home of Houston, discovered that its crime lab had been issuing false positives in drug possession cases. So officials went back and retested thousands of cases. What they found in the end result is that black people, the black people make, made only 20% of Harris County's population they made up 60% of the wrongful possession of narcotics cases. A 2017 report done by Reason itself found that the vast majority of civil asset forfeitures in Chicago were in black neighborhoods. And though forfeiture is often touted as a way to prevent drug kingpins from keeping ill-gotten gains, the median value of the property seized was $1,049. We can look at jury selection. Studies have consistently shown that prosecutors strike black people from juries at far higher rates than white people. A study of 10 years of trials in Philadelphia found that prosecutors struck 52% of black jurors versus 23% of white. A 2011 study of 20 years of trials by the Michigan State Law School found similar numbers. Prosecutors struck 53% of black jurors versus 26% of white. The authors of that study crunched the numbers and estimated that the odds of a discrepancy that big occurring from a race-neutral selection was about 1 in 10 trillion. Let's look at sentencing. Here too, study after study has found that when white and black defendants have similar criminal histories and have convict been convicted of similar crimes, judges consistently sentence black people to more prison time. A 2017 study by the US Sentencing Commission found that black people on average get 20% longer sentences for similar crimes, even after adjusting for age and criminal history. Black people are consistently more likely to get sentencing enhancements and authorized by federal drug control, or excuse me, gun control laws. A New Jersey study found that black and Latino people made up 96% of defendants sentenced to extra time under the state's drug-free school zones law. Look at bail. A recent Columbia University study found that black people are far more likely to be, taint, to be tamed pre-trial uh, when accused of similar crimes, even uh, after adjusting for criminal histories. Black people are also, also less likely to be paroled and more likely to be violated from parole or probation for what are called technical offenses. And these are offenses where the, the person didn't actually commit a new crime, uh, but you know, missed a curfew or, or associated with the wrong people um, or other sort of technical uh, administrative offenses. Uh, let's look at gang laws. So a lot of cities and states have passed laws uh, that, that offer sentencing enhancements if you're associated with a gang. Uh, a recent study found that more than half of the people on Mississippi's gang registry were actually white. Uh, generally uh, people who are associated with white supremacist groups. And yet the same study found that every single person prosecuted under the state's gang law from 2010 to 2017 was white. Every single person. Um, we look at police use of force. Um, what we found when we look at police use of force is city after city after city, police overwhelmingly use the vast majority of uh, force, excuse me, disproportionate amount of force on black people. Tend, they tend to use more force on black people, particularly under similar circumstances. Uh, there was, a really, there was a, a, recent, a really interesting recent study that looked at 911 calls. Uh, and what the study found is that when 
Police officers were sent, when 911 calls sent police officers to white or mixed race neighborhoods, white and black officers used force at about the same rates. But when a 911 call sent police officers to black neighborhoods, majority black neighborhoods, um, white officers were much, much more likely to use force than black officers and more likely to use uh, greater degrees of force. Um, one of the most interesting areas, and then I'll wrap up, I think that, that I found in studying this is something I hadn't even really uh, thought much about until I started compiling the studies, and that's this issue of colorism. So stud study after study has found that not only uh, are black people generally treated worse in the criminal justice system than white people, but the blacker a person is, the worse they're treated by the criminal justice system. And in fact, it's almost on a continuum. Um, as your, your skin color gets darker and darker and darker, uh, these discrepancies that we see are more and more likely to affect you and, and affect you in more severe ways. Now, the counter to all of this is that is generally that black people commit uh, crimes at a higher rate than white people. Therefore, we should expect them to be treated uh, worse by the criminal justice system. I would submit that if you look at the studies that I've compiled in this survey at the Washington Post, a lot of these studies control for things like crime rates and criminal records and criminal pasts. Um, but this colorism thing is really interesting because, you know, it isn't that blacker people commit more crimes than lighter skinned black people, right? If you believe that, then you have to, you, you, you likely subscribe to some sort of biological or genetic origin of criminality uh, for the reason why black people commit crimes at higher rates as opposed to sort of cultural or, or discriminate, historical discrimination. Um, and, you know, I would submit that nobody sort of participating in or, or, or viewing this debate, I would hope, <laughs> uh, subscribes to the idea that there's some sort of genetic uh, predisposition uh, to criminality in black people. Um, if the criminal justice system is treating darker skinned black people worse than lighter skinned black people, um, I think that's a pretty good indication that the criminal justice system itself is judging people based on the color of their skin uh, and not uh, necessarily the severity of the crimes or their criminal histories. Um, I'll just wrap up by saying, I think, uh, again, I, you know, I couldn't, uh, I wish I could, I could take another hour and go through all the data that I've compiled over the last couple of years. Um, but I am somebody who, when I first got into this, I was skeptical of the, of, of the notion that uh, racial uh, discrimination was rampant in the criminal justice system. I would submit that you can't work on this beat for very long uh, and still hold to that, that assumption. Um, the evidence is just overwhelming and it hits you in the face sort of every day that you look at this. Uh, and it's a reason why I've, I've completely sort of uh, changed the way I think about these issues. Thanks, and I uh, look forward to um, Raphael's response. Thank you, uh, Radley. Um, Raphael, uh, you have the same 17 and a half minutes to speak for the negative on the resolution. Take it away, Raphael. Oh, thank you. I, I'd like to actually start by saying thank you to Eugene and the Soho Forum for the invitation, um, and thank you to Radley for, for the challenge. Um, I've long been a fan of these debates. I've actually, uh, I was an attendee of the very first Soho Forum back in 2016. Uh, in which uh, my Manhattan Institute colleague Heather McDonald emerged victorious, a feat I, I hope I'm able to pull off here tonight. And, you know, with the temperature of, of the ongoing debate about policing and criminal justice in America right now reaching what seems like an all-time high, I think measured and, and thoughtful exchanges of ideas are, are important. And so um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to contribute to this dialogue, and I hope that I'm able to do justice to uh, an argument that I'm making in defense of institutions that, while most certainly are, are, are imperfect, uh, nonetheless have produced an incredible amount of good for, for many of the most vulnerable among us. Um, and so with that, you know, let's, let's, let's get to the question at hand, which is, is there overwhelming evidence that the criminal justice system is racist? Um, and despite a well-delivered opening statement by my opponent, the answer remains no. And to understand why, I think we have to start with the question of what it means for a system to be racist, in this case, mostly against black Americans. And that takes me to the first of six critiques that I have of Radley's argument. And the first is that Radley's working definition of systemic racism in the context of our debate here tonight is, as he put it recently in his column to which he, he uh, made reference, it's satisfied when systems and institutions, quote, produce racially disparate outcomes regardless of the intentions of people who work within them. Now, this sets an artificially low bar by sidestepping intent and thereby relieving proponents of this view of the responsibility of establishing not just that the criminal justice system produces racially disparate outcomes, but that it is operated for the purpose of producing those outcomes. After all, there is no such thing as accidental racism. 
right? And so on the right question, on that question, the evidence is most certainly not overwhelming. Now, if you read the article that, that Radley referenced, the title of which inspired this debate, what you'll see are a, a ton of examples, many of which are duplicative, by the way, of, of my second critique, which is that in order to make his point, uh, Mr. Balco is conflating racial disparities with racism. And he does this by focusing on the criminal justice system's outputs, things like traffic stops, citations, arrests, uses of force, sentences, etc. But he does that without considering the inputs to the system. That is, in most cases, without actually controlling for the factors besides racial animus that, that, that often go a long way toward explaining pretty big chunks of the disparities on which he hangs his hat. And doing this allows him to attribute to the system responsibility for outcomes that are driven largely uh, by many of those who find themselves ensnared by it. Right? And here are a couple of examples of what I mean. So a lot of people have been pointing to a study recently published by the National Academy of Sciences, which puts the odds of black men dying at the hands of police at one in 1,000, to double the odds for men generally. Now, if you believe that this disparity constitutes prima facie evidence of racism, as, as Mr. Balco seems to, consider that the very same studies show that the odds of women dying at the hands of police were just one in 33,000. Now, can we conclude from this that the criminal justice system is fairly characterized by rabid misandry? Of course not. Right? And so uh, let, let, let's, let's go to my second example. Radley's article summarizes the blurbs regarding the drug war as follows. Quote, black people are consistently arrested, charged, and convicted of drug crimes, including possession, distribution, and conspiracy at far higher rates than white people. And this despite research showing that both races use and sell drugs at about the same rate. End quote. Now, the problem with this framing is that controlling for use and sale rates is insufficient to establish that these disparities by and large reflect racial animus. And for one thing, it fails to account for how police resources are deployed, which is often a function of disparate violent crime rates. And violent crime is not evenly distributed throughout the country. Geographically, uh, it's not evenly distributed throughout the states. It's not evenly distributed in cities or even neighborhoods, right? Consider, consider the city of Chicago, for example, where the 2018 homicide rate for just four contiguous community areas, East Garfield Park, West Garfield Park, Humboldt Park, and Austin, was at 63.75 per 100,000, triple the citywide rate of 20 per 100,000. And it was about 10 times the national rate, which is about five per 100,000. Nor is the demographic distribution of violent crime even. Those four community areas in Chicago are almost entirely comprised of black and Latino residents. And the unfortunate reality is that when it comes to some of the most violent crimes, homicide in particular, that uneven demographic distribution persists at the national level. Indeed, while black men constitute about 7% of the nation's population, they comprise close to half of no murder victims in 2018. And historically, based on homicide data from 1980 to 2008, published by the Bureau of Justice Statistics, blacks are about six times more likely to be the victim of a homicide than their white counterparts. They're about eight times more likely to be the perpetrators of a homicide. In 2016, a study published by the Annals of Internal Medicine found that black men were more than 10 times more likely to be the victim of a homicide than their white counterparts that year. And so the question really is whether it is legitimate for police to focus their attention on the places in which violent crime is so elevated and on the people suspected of driving that crime? And the answer to that question is yes. Deploying scarce resources in response to disparate rates of serious violent crime is not only legitimate, but it's also race neutral. And yet what we see in the sort of argument that, that Radley is making here tonight is a consistent failure to account for how legitimate disparities in resource deployment inform the likelihood of encounters that produce the racially disparate outcomes. If there are more police in black neighborhoods, you're going to have more police encounters with black men and women, right? On this second point still, the, it, it, there's, it's, there's something else that the argument about the drug war uh, that, that Radley makes in his article ignores, which is the reality that drug enforcement is often pretextual uh, as an attack on violent crime. And that goes for other low-level crime enforcement. In other words, how and where police and prosecutors enforce drug laws and other lower-level offenses is not only or even mainly a function of drug use or drug sales, but rather a violent crime, which is something that they are seeking to reduce 
through drug enforcement based on their perception, a reasonable perception, that a substantial overlap between drug offenders and violent criminals in high crime neighborhoods exists. And a few statistics reveal that those perceptions are not crazy. In 2017, Baltimore police identified 118 murder suspects. More than 70% of them had at least one drug arrest in their criminal history. A recent Bureau of Justice statistics study on recidivism found that more than three quarters of released drug offenders from state prisons would go on to be rearrested for a non-drug crime. More than a third would go on to be rearrested for a violent crime specifically. Now, this reality is explained by it helps explain, I think, why the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, which, by the way, established the 100 to 1 sentencing disparity between crack and powder cocaine, which is often cited as evidence of racism, was co-sponsored by 16 of the 19 members of the Congressional Black Caucus at the time. And this relates to a point that I'm going to expand on shortly. Now, you can say, and I might even agree with you, that this doesn't change the moral philosophical case against the drug war. And as someone who leans pretty libertarian myself, I'd sympathize. But I don't think you can fault policymakers from operating pursuant to the public policy case for drug enforcement, which seeks to answer different questions than the moral philosophical question, uh, case, right? And, and most importantly, that public policy case is race neutral insofar as it's driven by violence. Now, lastly, on this, this second critique, I'll note that the drug war is actually not driving racial disparities in black incarceration, which I think is a pretty important point to make. Right, while blacks constitute approximately 35% of violent offenders, 43% of weapon offenders, uh, 26% of property offenders, and 28% of drug offenders in state prisons, uh, what you need to know is that were we to release every single drug offender tomorrow, the black percentage of the state prison population would not change. In fact, it would actually increase very slightly. Now, the third critique I have here is that all the disparities that Radley is focused on in his remarks and in his article are disparities in enforcement data as if enforcement statistics are the only outputs that our criminal justice system produces. Well, they're not, right? Radley's remarks ignore what is perhaps the most important output of our criminal justice system over the last 30 years, crime declines, big ones. Through policing, through prosecution, through incarceration, the criminal justice system has produced massive declines in crime since the 1990s. And those declines have inured primarily to the benefit of black and brown communities across the country. Right, consider the following excerpts from uh, a book by NYU sociologist Patrick Sharkey entitled Uneasy Peace, which, by the way, was very critical of policing and incarceration. He writes, quote, even the staunchest critics of mass incarceration acknowledge that the expansion of the imprisoned population contributed to the decline in violence. On this point, he concedes, quote, there is no longer much debate. And he goes on, quote, the impact of the decline in homicide on the life expectancy of black men is roughly equivalent to the impact of eliminating obesity altogether. For every 100,000 black men, over 1,000 more years of time with friends and family have been preserved because of the drop in the murder rate, end quote. Now, his book presents a bountiful literature showing, among other things, that declines in violent crime in black neighborhoods improved educational outcomes, increased upward, upward mobility, which he wrote, by the way, is, quote, much less likely in cities with high levels of violence. Now, the unequal distribution of the benefits of crime fighting complicates Mr. Balco's argument here because there just isn't a particularly good explanation for why a system apparently designed and operated for the purpose of oppressing a racial minority would so disproportionately benefit members of that minority when the system achieves its stated goals according to the leaders at the system's helms. Now, another reality that is incongruous with the resolution my opponent is defending here tonight is that the criminal justice system's is the criminal justice system's responsiveness to calls for reform, which by the way have led to reductions in both arrests and incarceration that again have disproportionately benefited black Americans. As my Manhattan Institute colleague Coleman Hughes recently put it, quote, from 2001 to 2017, the incarceration rate for black men declined by 34%. Now let's just consider what's happened since George Floyd's reprehensible death prompted nationwide protests and calls for reform, right? You've since had several major pieces of legislation proposed at the federal level. You've had police departments, including the NYPD, just disbanded, which just disbanded its plain uh, clothes anti-crime teams change internal policies. And here in New York State, we've had Governor Cuomo sign into law 10 police reform bills. And all this without a change in the composition of the players that make up the system, which begs the question, why would a system operated for the purpose of oppressing minorities 
he calls for reform that not only come disproportionately from minority communities, but stem from protests in response to the killing of a black man and reinvigorated a movement led by an organization called Black Lives Matter. It wouldn't. My fifth critique here is that Radley's definition of systemic racism allows him to conveniently ignore the role that black and brown Americans play as police officers, investigators, prosecutors, judges, lawmakers, and even voters in bringing about the racially disparate outcomes that he says are overwhelmingly against racism. According to a 2015 report by Governing, almost 28% of police officers are minorities. In his thoughtful book, Locking Up Our Own, James Foreman Jr., Eruditely documents this story, highlighting that 64% of black respondents uh, to a sentencing project survey, for example, stated that they thought courts were not harsh enough on criminals. And these attitudes were very well documented by Michael J. Fortner in his great book, Silent Black Majority, which sets, which, which sets out the role that black New Yorkers have played in pushing the now infamous Rockefeller drug laws over the finish line. Right? So the implication in my opponent's argument is that to the extent that people who look like me contribute in various ways to the criminal justice system's outputs, they do so as unwitting participants duped into carrying out their own oppression. Now, this is both implausible, it's also offensive. All right? Now, Fortner's book also characterized the criminal justice system as, quote, disaggregated and uncoordinated, or, quote, almost a non-system. And this is salient because it takes me to my sixth and final point. At its root, Radley's central thesis that the criminal justice system was designed to achieve the, res the result of racially disparate enforcement against blacks in a way that renders irrelevant the intentions of the system's operators attributes to the federal, state, and local governments of the United States a level of organizational and managerial aptitude that no self-respecting libertarian would ever attribute to the state. Right? At its core, what Mr. Balco is alleging here is, to quote the great George Costanza, that minorities, mostly blacks, have, quote, become the target of a systematic process of intimidation and manipulation, the likes of which, well, you get my point. And so given that the Soho Forum is very much libertarian turf, I hope that I don't have to try too hard to evince your skepticism of the claim that institutions that constitute our criminal justice systems were erected to effectively and consistently bring about certain results over generations in such a way that, as my opponent would have you believe, renders it impervious to the intentions of its operators. I, I, I don't think that it's hard to find that impossible. Now, I don't know about you, I, I, I just can't buy the idea that such a large collection of government agencies is capable of that kind of success. And so I wanna end by, by saying that, that though rare, unjustifiable police violence is something that should seriously concern us all. And, and so it's important for us to engage the arguments that have resurfaced in the wake of George Floyd's truly infuriating death uh, head on. And I want you to know that I understand personally the concerns about racial disparities given stories like Mr. Floyd, um, as well as the stained history of, of law enforcement here in the United States. And while I believe that black and brown communities have disproportionately enjoyed the benefits produced by the American criminal justice system, I also understand that we have disproportionately borne some of the costs. And we can acknowledge all of that without throwing the baby out with the bathwater, which as we now see with the rise in popularity of, of police and prison abolitionism in America, is the logical extension of the argument that Mr. Balco made here tonight. And that argument does not, as I see it, hold up under close scrutiny. However, that there is not overwhelming evidence that the criminal justice system is racist does not mean that there isn't work to be done. And that there is work to be done is no reason to refrain from defending the system against the charge of racism, which is something I think, I hope, I have done capably here tonight. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Raphael. Uh, Radley, uh, we now go to the rebuttal part of the evening. Radley, you get five minutes of rebuttal. Take it away, Radley. Uh, well, I'll start to say, I think it's interesting that Raviel cites um, a couple of studies to rebut me that I didn't actually cite in my argument. Um, uh, you know, his point about outcomes versus inputs doesn't explain, for example, why prosecutors are over overwhelmingly uh, likely to strike black people from jurors instead of white people. This denies black people participation in the uh, criminal justice system and their specific uh, responsibility to serve on juries also denies black defendants the right to have a, a representative jury, a trial by their peers. Uh, it doesn't account for the fact that I mentioned several times that police are much more likely to search black motorists after stopping them 
uh, even though searches of white motors consistently turn up more uh, illegal drugs and, and illicit weapons or, or more likely to turn them up. Doesn't, uh, it doesn't address the fact that we look at the death penalty. Uh, the race of the victim uh, in, a death in a murder case is much more likely to determine the death penalty, whether the death penalty is applied than anything else. People who kill white people are much more likely to get to the death penalty than people who kill black people. Um, it doesn't account for um, you know, uh, various other uh, uh, aspects of criminal justice. We're, we're actually, the, 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 the idea that you factor in crime rates or the rate of, of crime in neighborhoods that are policed uh, have already been accounted for in the studies and already been adjusted for. Um, a good example of this is stop and frisk. Uh, a New York Times analysis found that there was no correlation between where uh, New York uh, police officers conducted stop and frisks and the uh, number of guns seized from those particular communities. Um, the vast majority of people who were stop and frisked, while stop and frisk was a policy in New York City, were innocent. About 90% were innocent. About 90% were also black or Latino. And so what you have here is a policy that disproportionately affects uh, minority communities, uh, overwhelmingly harasses and subjects innocent people to these uh, uh, sort of humiliating uh, uh, searches on the street. And that does very, very little in terms of actually uh, addressing gun issues in the neighborhoods where guns are a problem. Um, as for the idea that sort of we, we send uh, police officers into communities where the most where there's most crime or there's most violent crime, um, the Washington Post did a study earlier this year that found that police are actually really bad at solving hom homicides, and they're worse at solving homicides in black uh, black communities. In fact, uh, if I have the number correct, and I may be misremembering it slightly, but it's le I believe less than 30 percent of black uh, murders of black people in Chicago were, were solved by the Chicago Police Department. Now. If the whole idea of we're sending cops into your neighborhood uh, to protect you from violent crime, and so you're going to have to put up with these disproportionate stops and searches and arrests, uh, you know, in order to uh, promote your own safety, uh, you would think the police would actually have a better or do a better job of solving crimes in those communities. Um, Raphael cites the the, car, the the decline in the crime rate since the mid 1990s as a uh, um, as a sort of justification for some of these racial disparities or, or suggesting that those of us who um, are, are upset about racial disparities in the criminal justice system don't factor in uh, the number the, the uh, benefit to black communities by the decline in crime. However, there's no evidence actually that incarceration and aggressive policing are responsible for the drop in the crime rate. Um, in fact, uh, the studies I've seen attribute incarceration and carceral policies to about five uh, to 20% of the crime drop that we've seen since the mid 1990s. Uh, in fact, um, uh, criminologists are, are, are constantly arguing with each other about what caused the crime drop. I see very little evidence that we should attribute uh, any or most of it to uh, uh, aggressive policing or mass incarceration or policies that led to mass incarceration. Um, we've seen everything from sort of lead, uh, the, the avail uh, lead pollution to uh, abortion to um, uh, the aging population. I mean, there are all sorts of factors. Uh, the idea that we should sort of hang our hat on the fact that, you know, putting more people in prison and putting more uh, disproportionate number of minority people in prison uh, or subjecting them to aggressive policing is somehow saving them. Uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of data to back that up. Um, uh, Raphael also talks about um, uh, unwitting participants or the fact that minority people in the criminal justice system, that they're somehow being duped. Um, I will say that lots of minorities uh, in the criminal justice system have spoken out about the very same things that I'm talking about. The uh, National Association of Black Police Officers regularly decries racial profiling, regularly decries discrepancies in the way the drug laws are, are enforced. Um, there are lots of groups within the criminal justice system that have been raising these very same issues. It's not that they don't see them or that they're unwilling dupes. It's that uh, they still sort of believe in public service, uh, but they're raised, they, they want to, to fix the problems within it. Um, but it's Raphael's final point that that this that suggesting that the system is racist um, uh, ascribes to it a certain aptitude that no libertarian should sort of think a government is capable of. Nobody's suggesting that this is a, a conspiracy, that this is organized, that there's a sort of, you know, Zoom meeting of police officers every morning. Uh, you know, sure. There's some Zoom meeting of police officers every morning where they discuss how they're going to oppress minority people. The argument is that this is a system that was built and designed and honed and evolved in an era where everyone agrees that there was systematic uh, racism and discrimination in America. And these are the same institutions that survive today and that without 
sort of going through and, and you know, carefully studying and examining what in those systems uh, we need to get rid of or change uh, in order to affect um, uh, sort of purge it of those inclinations. Uh, that's what we need to do. There's no, there's no argument that this is some sort of organized uh, conspiracy of, of oppression and racism. It's that these systems were designed for that, and these are the same systems we use today, uh, and we need to sort of go through and, and figure out what, what we need to change to make them better. All right, thanks. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, Bradley, you get a little bit of extra time on your rebuttal, because uh, Bradley took a little bit of extra. Uh, so take it away, Bradley, with your rebuttal. Uh, thank you, thank you. I, um, I, I missed a, a little bit of that because there was, there was a, a bit of jumping around, but um, I'm, I'm going to try and uh, quickly respond to, to uh, at least the, some of the points that jumped out at me. I mean, the first thing is, is this argument uh, that there are these you know, alternative uh, you know, explanations for huge chunks of the crime decline really is, is, is basis. I mean, Bradley can say that there isn't a lot of evidence in support of this, but, but the reality is, is, is that there is. I've cited it in much of my work. Um, you know, even the sentencing project in a 2005 report came out and said that 25% of the crime decline in the 1990s could be attributed to incarceration. Um, you know, uh, again, this idea that it's not, that this isn't an organized effort, again, I think undermines the claim insofar as, uh, at least if you subscribe to the idea that racism, uh, or showing racism requires a showing of intent. Again, you cannot be accidentally racist, this idea that, you know, this 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 system uh, just kind of accidentally produces these outcomes without any intent is really or or, or at least due to the intent of of people you know who are dead today um, it really just evinces one of two things which is either a conspiracy argument or just an accidental racism argument neither of which really holds water um, this idea that abortion um, <laughs> drove a chunk of the crime decline uh, that came anywhere close to things like uh, imprisonment or or more aggressive uh, proactive policing. Um, is, is interesting to explore because what it implies, especially given the rate of black abortion, is that there is some higher propensity for uh, black children to grow up to be criminals and therefore by taking them out of the world preemptively, um, you make way for a, a decline in crime. And I, I don't find that convincing, nor do I, I, I see any real evidence of that. I would point uh, people here to uh, Barry Latzer's book, which, which addresses in, in great detail uh, both the abortion and lead poisoning arguments. Um, you know, this idea that, that, that the studies that Radley sets out in his article, uh, by and large, control for the relevant factors uh, that are necessary to control for in order to isolate racial animus, um, really just is a mischaracterization. I went through, as he was talking, uh, I was able to get through the first 19 uh, studies that he cites in, in that Washington Post article. None of them had anywhere near uh, sufficient uh, controls um, or robustness checks to to, to actually isolate um, a, a racism, right? Uh, you know, um, so when he says a lot of these studies have these controls, I think what he means is there's not very many at all. Um, you know, when he talks about, again, outputs, um, things like traffic stops, you know, I would point you to a study uh, done in New Jersey uh, uh, um, in the Garden State Parkway, which actually uh, over a period of time using high-tech cameras took pictures of motorists uh, and took a cross-sectional sample of motorists on the Garden State Parkway. And what it found was that black motorists, black male motorists in particular, were so much more likely to speed um, than uh, their counterparts on the road that actually uh, explained the entirety of the gap in, in, in people being pulled over by the New Jersey State Police. Um, you know, so again, uh, that's not to say that adding these controls will always explain the entirety of the gap. Um, but I don't think it has to, right? The, the claim here is not that there isn't some racism at some points in some places within the criminal justice system. The claim here is that by and large, uh, there is so much racism in the criminal justice system that it is endemic to it, such that we can characterize the system as racist. Again, I just don't think um, that Radley's really carried uh, that argument here today. Um, you know, when we talk about things like stop, question, and frisk, again, you know, the evidence really pushed back against uh, Radley's characterization. I'd point you to a 2014 study done by David Weisberg, uh, a, a criminologist at, at George Mason, which actually found that in high crime neighborhoods in New York City, which again had mostly minority populations, um, the added presence of police and the knowledge within the public that police were engaging in more proactive activity actually did have a significant deterrent effect on crime such that the fact that guns weren't recovered in a huge amount of these stops isn't really the point, right? The point is, is that by doing, having these interactions, um, you were sending a signal that actually ended up changing behavior, still allowing police to achieve their goal. Again, doesn't mean that, that was the best way to go about it. The 
that's beside the point that we're debating here today. The point that we're debating here today is whether those actions were driven by racial animus uh, against uh, uh, black people. I, I don't think uh, that, that we can say um, that that's the case. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop it there. Okay. Uh, well, that concludes uh, the initial part of the evening. Uh, we now go to the Q&A part. Uh, at any time, either of you can ask a question of the other. The moderator can do so, that's me, or I can uh, read uh, questions that came in from the audience. Uh, uh, you can do this at any time, but right now, Radley, is there a question you'd like to put to Raphael? Or do you want to waive that and see, it's up to you. Uh, yeah, I'll ask one. Um, let's go back to stop and frisk. I mean, um, you know, a stop and frisk, it's, it's a sort of knowledge that police presence in these communities is why uh, crime uh, went down in these communities. Then why did crime continue to go down after stop and frisk ended? And I would just add that your, your colleague, Heather McDonald, predicted that there was going to be a massive surge in crime, violent crime in New York City with the end of stop and frisk. That didn't happen. Uh, so how do you explain that? Uh, well, again, um, saying that that didn't happen is to aggregate the city's crime data as if crime is experienced in the aggregate, and it's not, right? Crime is extremely concentrated within the city of New York, just as it's extremely concentrated everywhere else in the United States. So to look at crime trends in the city as a whole and say, well, these were pretty flat, irrespective of how things change, is really the kind of wrong measure, which is why I, Dave, I cited David Weisberg's study, which does a microgeographic analysis, which is the right unit of measurement here to look to see how crime changes in specifically the high crime areas. And there, there was a very statistically significant uh, effect after all uh, controls were entered into and robustness checks were made. The other thing I would say here too, is that stop and frisk, you know, it's a term that we kind of bandy about, but there's actually a lot of evidence to show that a, a pretty big chunk of the interactions that were recorded on UF 250s, which were the forms that NYPD officers had to submit when they did a stop and frisk, um, were actually not legally stop and frisks, right? You have to remember that there was an incentive in place uh, back then that the department created when it made stop activity part of a police officer's evaluation. And when uh, police officers were in low crime areas, they were still held to that standard, which induced them to record a lot of interactions that didn't actually rise to the level of a stop and frisk as stops and frisks, right? And, uh, one of the ways we, we can kind of have some circumstantial evidence of this being the case is a recent piece of legislation passed by the City Council on the Right to Know Act. The Right to Know Act's premise, which was passed in, in 2017, by the way, the premise of the Right to Know Act is that even after the big decline in reported stops by the NYPD, people were still regularly consenting to police searches such that activity like that did not decrease all that much. And the conclusion was that they were consenting based on an ignorance of their right to withhold that consent. And so if the incentive structure in place at the time when stop and frisk was near its peak was such that police officers would have been incented to record as Terry stops in uh, interactions that were actually consented to, um, that would actually change the trend lines quite a bit. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that's something that you have to consider too. Uh, any comment on that, Radley? Uh, no, okay. Uh, Raphael, uh, do you have a question you want to put to Radley? Uh, no, no, I think let's just go to audience questions. I see that there's a lot in the chat there, so. I want to okay, to the uh, well, uh, I want to uh, I want to put a question to you both, just to clarify how far apart you are on the issue of the cause in the plummet, of the, of, of the plummeting crime rate. I take it both of you agree that the plummeting crime rate did benefit uh, blacks. Both of you agree with that, that it was a big benefit to blacks. Uh, and that in that sense, uh, it, uh, it came, it, 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 uh, it was sort of pro anti-racism rather than pro. Uh, but uh, Radley, uh, your position is that the two factors, which is incarceration and more aggressive policing, more incarceration, more aggressive policing, those two factors had no effect or did I hear you say it's like 15 to 20%? Could you clarify your position on that? The more incarceration and more uh, aggressive policing affecting the plummeting crime rate. Yeah, the, the, the academic research puts it that somewhere between five and 20%. Uh, I guess Raphael found a study that's 25%. Even assuming it's, it's 25%, I mean, that is 
That is a fourth of the crime drop in response to a massive increase in, in mass incarceration. Uh, so I don't, um, you know, I, I think there are, we don't know exactly what caused the crime drop. Also, I would just like to add that I, I mentioned, <laughs> I mentioned abortion as a, in the course of discussing uh, all the theories that have been put oh. forth by criminologists for possible reasons for the crime drop. I was not suggesting that I personally believe that that caused the crime drop. Uh, and it's a little, uh, I think, disingenuous to sort of accuse me of being a racist because I cited a theory that many criminologists have put out uh, about what caused the crime drop. All right. Well, that, that clarifies things uh, in terms of your position on abortion. Uh, but you were saying can, you know, that- Can I just jump in one uh, to say one thing, Gene? Yes. Which is, well, first off, I, I, I want to make clear that I was certainly not implying that you're a racist, Radley. Um, I don't think you would be arguing your side of this uh, of this resolution uh, if you were. However, um, I, I want to just make clear that I'm not sure how far apart we are on the causes of uh, the crime decline is really all that relevant, right? The relevant point here is that this question goes to intent, right? And every single defender of the criminal justice system, every single leader within the criminal justice system that argues that those be benefits were attributable to their actions evinces their own state of mind which is important here because my argument is that the criminal justice system is not operated to hurt black people. And if so, people like Bill Bratton or Dermot, uh, Dermot Shea or Ray Kelly or Rudy Giuliani or whoever it is that you have in mind, William Barr, if their argument is that these crime declines in Europe primarily to the benefit of blacks, when the system operates the way that they think it should, then that evinces their own state of mind, which is not a racist state of mind. And that is the point that I'm making here today. Uh, I would just go back to the point that, I, I, again, the idea of systemic racism is not that people are operating with a racist mindset or racist intention. It's that there's a system that was originally designed to produce racist outcomes, and it is continuing to produce them, regardless of the intent of people within that system. But I also say that just saying that the decline rate has benefited black people means that the system has benefited black people discounts the untold or <laughs> immeasurable damage that has been done to black communities by uh, mass incarcerations, not just to people incarcerated in their families, but there studies showing that it spreads almost like a disease throughout entire communities, um, that it's been devastating to black communities. So, you know, yes, the crime decline has benefited. The question is, could we have gotten the same or similar decline without putting, uh, uh, you know, uh, masses of people in prison or subjecting people to giving people criminal records that didn't deserve it, which, you know, affects them for the rest of their lives. Could we have done this? Could the crime decline have happened without all of that? And I think there's good evidence that it could have. Okay. Um, so uh, I actually, you anticipated a question uh, that I've seen from the audience and I also wanted to put to you, Brad, uh, Radley. You're saying that even though there are uh, black police chiefs, even though uh, you mentioned that the uh, black people in government in the St. Louis suburbs uh, are implementing certain things. You're basically saying that black people are themselves, have become themselves agents in racism by becoming a part of the criminal justice system, that black people are effectively purveyors of racism toward their own kind because of the systemic analysis that you put forward. Is that a correct clarification of your view? Would that be correct summary? I, I mean, I think there are black people in the criminal justice system who realize that the, who admit that the criminal justice system is is racist and try to change it uh, from the inside. Well, but there are. Um, but you said in the case of St. Louis, for example, or indeed there are yeah. many black police chiefs in many areas. There are black cops. Uh, so the many black people disproportionately aren't black people uh, disproportionately represented in the criminal justice system professionally as employees. So most of them presumably are agents of racism. Would that be correct, in your view? Sure, because they're they're inside. They're they are operating in the system. Particularly, if you look at St. Louis County, and I think this is why it's such a great example. If you are a black police officer in one of these small municipalities that that probably shouldn't exist and only exist because of this sort of historical uh, racism, uh, your job is to uh, generate fines and fees from black people who live in your city in order for your government to continue to exist. In order for you to continue to have a job, I mean the the you know the the classic sort of conservative critique of a, of a government jobs program is paying one person to dig a ditch and the other person to fill it up. Well, here in St. Louis County, you have entire municipalities where the police department's sole purpose is to generate fines and fees so that the police department can continue to exist. 
That is a huge problem. And it's more prominent actually in black areas of the county and in, in, in blacker cities, because those cities tend to get less uh, in less revenue from income tax. So they're more reliant on fines and fees. So yeah, I think if you are a, a black person operating one of those systems, uh, you are hurting black residents as a result of sort of historical legacy, uh, whatever you want to call it, systemic racism. Um, I'm not saying those people are racist. I'm saying that is the de very definition of systemic racism. It's a system that produces racist outcomes because it was sort of built to, regardless of the motivations of the people who operate inside of it. Well, you would also say, just to clarify, Fred, that, that again, since even outside that, uh, that those governments, a, a disproportionate number of people in law enforcement are black. So they, for the most part, are also agents of racism, uh, in your view. If the, I, I think that they are, are participating in a system that, that was designed to produce racist outcomes and that is producing racist outcomes. I'm not going to say they're ages of racism because that describes them a mindset that, that you know, I, don't, I, can't, I can't read their mind. And I'm, I'm sure most of them aren't racism, racist against their own guy, but they are participating in a system that disproportionately affects uh, the black people in their communities. And, and it's a system that was designed to do that. We've had many questions about this. So, uh, uh, Raphael, uh, could you clarify your position? about the distinction between uh, results and intent. Uh, could you go over that again? Yeah, no, I think, uh, again, uh, th this, is, this is the point here, right? Bradley can say that the definition of systemic racism is that you know, the system produces these outcomes without regard to intent, but that doesn't necessarily make it so. Racism in ism, right, refers to a state of mind, refers to a set of beliefs. Um, racism requires at least some showing of intent, and the fact that me, there are many black uh, and, and brown police officers, prosecutors, judges, lawmakers in, in, in various parts of the country, um, you know, who, who have contributed in one way or another to some of the outcomes that Radley uh, cites as evidence of racism, I think undermines his point to the extent that you buy my argument, which is that a showing of intent is necessary, right? I mean, in 1991, um, uh, William F. Buckley debated Charlie Rangel uh, among other people, uh, on the proposition of whether we should end the drug war. And Charlie Rangel was, op was, was arguing in favor of perpetuating the drug war, at one point uh, suggesting uh, life in prison for certain crack dealers. Right? And this is, this is a guy who helped push the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986. This was a guy who was supportive of the Rockefeller drug laws. And so you know, th the idea that someone like Charles Rangel, congressman to Harlem for God knows how many years, was, you know, uh, uh, helping to operate a, a racist system is, is, I think, really strange for Julie. Yeah. Okay. Um, with respect to a few of the specific examples that Radley uh, has used, uh, could you address a couple of them uh, that you perhaps uh, did not specifically speak to, Raphael? In particular, for example, he mentioned that uh, that uh, jurors are on panels, juries, are, blacks are not chosen to be on juries the way whites are, uh, and uh, that that's uh, that obviously harms uh, black people who are on trial before those juries. Uh, he mentioned a degree of blackness bias, and that uh, people who are uh, very black uh, tend to uh, be uh, mistreated more than, than lighter skinned blacks. Those two examples, do they mean anything to you? What's your response? Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't say that I am uh, thoroughly familiar with all the literature on jury selection, um, but I can say that there are mechanisms that are exercised pretty, pretty often to uh, uh, vindicate those rights. It's called a Batson challenge. Um, and, and there are many of those cases that, that make their way through. I would point out that here in New York City, um, uh, in Manhattan, um, where you have uh, more white jurors uh, uh, on criminal trials, there is a, a much higher rate of conviction in jury trials than in the Bronx, uh, which has one of the lowest rates of, of, of jury uh, trial conviction and, um, and much higher uh, proportions of, of, of black and brown jurors. And so, you know, I, I think that's, that's pretty good evidence that, that at the very least, uh, this trend is not nationwide. It is not something that characterizes this system as a whole. And this is, I, I think, another problem that these arguments suffer from, which is that you know, we take these stories, we take this one study, and, and we pretend that it represents the entire body of literature, or we, we pretend that it, that it characterizes the system by and large. And that, that just isn't the way reality works. Uh, and uh, 
you want to say the same thing about the degree of blackness uh, studies that uh, that Bradley? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, you know, this is. I have no doubt that in some aspects of of, of life, um, you know, skin tone is you know is a factor. I I, I just again I I have not seen those studies. I can't speak to their um, methodological integrity. Um, I am a little uh, suspicious of of the representation of them here today. Um, but yeah, I just I can't speak to something I haven't seen. I see. Uh I've gotten a, a few questions about the crime rate issue, so I want to go back to it just for a moment. Uh, Bradley it did seem to go possibly as high as 20 to 25 percent in attributing the decline in crime to more aggressive policing and incarceration. Uh, that 20 to 25 percent, hopefully, Bradley, step in, you did quote that, I believe. Uh, Raphael, uh, uh, could you? Uh, could you pick your number? Do you think yeah, that's it, about right or that's too low? It's 25%, to be clear, just for incarceration. That oh. does not include the role of policing, right? Um, so so, and so that, that sentencing project study uh, from 2005, um, which, which cites uh, uh, several pieces of literature, including some done by Stephen Levitt, um, came up with that 25% number, and that is attributable just to the role of incarceration, right? Policing, on top of that 25%, has produced all kinds of benefits, again, that have been geared primarily uh, to the benefit of black communities. And again, the main point here is that when proponents of the criminal justice system, when defenders of the criminal justice system talk about it, they talk with reverence about these crime declines. This is something that we are proud of, right? And that reality does not mesh with the claim that the system is racist. Right? It just doesn't make any sense that the racist system operated pursue, in a way that achieves its stated goals, as per the people running that system, benefits black and brown Americans to that high a degree. That does not make any sense. Uh, maybe I took your, uh, your name in vain. Radley, do you want to make a comment about the question I just put to Raphael? Uh, any any emphasis, any rebuttal, or do you, what do you want to say, if, if anything? Uh, no, I, just, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a mistake to sort of say, I mean, if the system, if the system benefited black people by, by reducing the homicide rate in black communities, it also uh, sowed a lot of uh, misery and despair by creating, uh, you know, entire generations of the black community of people who uh, were incarcerated or had a parent or family member incarcerated uh, who have a criminal record or have an arrest record, um, uh, you know, the over policing, uh, it is, and mass incarceration have had a, uh, a monumental effect on, on minority communities, particularly black communities in the U S and say that, you know, maybe 20, 25%, which it's, it's, it's a very difficult number to measure, um, of the crime drop may have been attributed to that. Uh, I think we have to factor in the harm that was done by those policies as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I would, I would just respond quickly by saying that you know it's no more difficult to put uh, uh, to pin that tail on the uh, on the donkey, so to speak, um, as it is you know to 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 sort of uh, isolate the role of racism in in things like jury selection, right? Their econometrics is an art, um, you know. So the idea that, that that we can just sort of say, well, oh, you know, that's 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 too hard to do, but these you should you should believe. Um, is, is a little a little uneven, but I also want to respond to this claim that incarceration is harming families, uh, because it it it, it is a, a a valid argument if you buy it. The problem is is that the evidence doesn't jive with this, right? Uh, a, a new working paper out of out of the University of Ohio uh, out of Ohio, I should say. Um, I'm going to quote it now because I, I wasn't planning on talking about it. It says, "Quote: Contrary to conventional wisdom, parental incarceration has beneficial effects on children." reducing their likelihood of incarceration by 4.9 percentage points and improving their adult socioeconomic status. Sibling incarceration leads to similar results in criminal activity. Now, the paper, which is entitled The Effects of Parental and Sibling Incarceration Evidence from Ohio, was co-authored by researchers at the University of Chicago, UC Berkeley, and USC. And what they did was they studied a sample of children with parents, quote, on the margins of incarceration. In other words, parents whose incarceration status would depend very heavily on the leniency or severity of the judges handling their cases. And they measured not only life outcome differences between the children with incarcerated parents or siblings and those without, but also 
the portion of those differ those di those differences attributable to the parents' incarceration. And this is not an anomalous study, right? This is part of a growing body of research um, that resembles uh, uh, other findings, right? So, in a study of incarcerated parents living with their children in North Carolina. University of Colorado professor Stephen Billings found that, quote, removing negative potential role models through incarceration benefits children, end quote, particularly in terms of their behavior at school. A paper out of Norway uh, estimated, quote, a 32 percentage point reduction over a four-year period in the probability of a younger brother being charged with the crime if his older brother is incarcerated. And uh, Caroline Ortega, uh, an economist out West, uh, in a 2018 study uh, of, of children in Colombia found that conditional on conviction parental incarceration actually increases years of education. So this idea that incarceration can just automatically, axiomatically be considered a net negative for children or families is, is, is not supported by the data. I, I'm, I'm kind of dumbfounded by this argument. The idea, I mean, it, groups like, the, like Manhattan have been saying for years that, you know, the breakdown of the black family is responsible for all, this, all these social ills in the black community. And the absence of fathers is critical, but now all of a sudden incarceration is good for children. Children having parents in prison, it's good for them. It's going to lead to better outcomes. I mean, the, the, I, I don't know these studies that you cited. They fly in the face of dozens and dozens of studies that have shown the harms of incarceration, not just on families that are incarcerated, but on entire communities and neighborhoods, uh, and that, that there's, a, there's actually a sort of public health model where incarceration can affect communities like a disease. I mean, I... I guess I'll have to check out these studies, but I, there's an overwhelmingly an overwhelming amount of empirical evidence uh, that contradicts them. So again, there's an overwhelming uh, body of evidence that shows that incarceration uh, does harm children. The question is whether it harms them on net, right, as compared to what? Now, whether a parent's presence in a child's life is beneficial will depend very heavily on whether that parent engages in high levels of antisocial behavior. Right? This is a term that researchers have been looking into for about 40 years in the psychological and sociological literature. Right? And, and when, when people you know, fail to conform to social norms, when they act deceitfully, impulsively, with reckless disregard for others, right, the, the literature on the intergenerational transmission of antisocial behavior is actually pretty robust. And what it suggests is that the presence of parents who engage in such behavior may actually be even worse for a child than the absence of a pro-social parent, right? So I'm going to quote another study uh, published in the Journal of Abnormal Child Psychology, which found, quote, fathers' antisocial behaviors predicted growth in children's externalizing and internalizing behavior problems with links stronger among resident father families, right? Another paper in the journal Child Development found, quote, the quality of, of a father's involvement matters more than his mere presence, and that children who live with fathers who, quote, engage in very high levels of antisocial behavior will go on to behave, quote, significantly worse than their peers whose fathers also engage of high, in high levels of antisocial behavior but do not reside with their children. So the idea that this does not fit within the broader literature, again, um, it, it's just not true. I, I wrote an entire essay about it in City Journal called Fathers, Families, and Incarceration. You can check it out there. This, uh, that also assumes that antisocial behavior, that people, uh, people who are imprisoned that enga are engaging in, in antisocial behavior just counts the fact that, you know, arresting people for drug possession, giving people criminal records uh, leads to antisocial behavior because you take away opportunity from them. Uh, you take away, you know, chances for them to just sort of, you know, live <laughs> a normal life, be present in their communities, be present for their families. It also assumes that 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 there's a, a a strong correlation between people who are imprisoned and imprisoned uh, that they're imprisoned because of their antisocial behavior. And I think there's a lot of examples of, of, of to the contrary to, to that as well. That uh, we don't, you know, the, the level of incarceration is not necessarily the level of, of to which people are, are antisocial or engage in antisocial behavior. Well, what I would say in response to that is that again, here there's there's actually a, a pretty decent uh, uh, amount of literature looking at the rate of antisocial behavior in prison populations. So, in 2002, the Lancet published a study uh, that showed that nearly uh, half of just under 19,000 male prisoners surveyed across 12 countries had antisocial personality disorder. A 2016 article. And translational psychiatry noted that while only between one and three percent of the general public have antisocial personality disorder, the disorder has a prevalence of quote forty to seventy percent in prison populations. Um, so you know, again, um, there, there's there's just a lot of data here that, that says you're wrong. Well, there's no uh, Raphael. I guess uh, Ravi might respond. Uh, uh, forgive me for uh, putting words in your mouth, Ravi. That once you enter prison, uh, it could make anybody antisocial. Is that 
Like sure. Really I mean, yeah, there, there's certainly some evidence to, to suggest that, that prison can have a criminogenic effect uh, 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 on people, but that doesn't explain what landed them there in the first place. And we know that prison is nowhere near a first sanction uh, for most people, right? Only about 40% of all uh, uh, state felony convictions result in a post-conviction prison sentence. So the idea that it's, you know, prison sort of making all of these people, uh, you know, sort of fall into these uh, antisocial patterns as opposed to, um, you know, these people having antisocial patterns that lead them to prison, again, I think strains cajoling. I would also suggest that, you know, getting stopped at risk 20 or 30 times over the course of a few years, from leaving your home or getting pulled over 40 times over the course of your life, uh, you know, despite not doing anything wrong, uh, might also, you know, eventually lead to some antisocial behavior or sort of questioning the way, the way society treats them. Yeah, I, I've I, got... Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, look, you know, that, that might contribute some, sure. I mean, and the false positive problem is a real one, right? I mean, if, if these crime trends are driving sort of police perceptions and they're driving police resources into these neighborhoods, there is going to be a higher rate of false positives within the demographic groups in those neighborhoods. But again, that does not necessarily mean we can, cate- we can characterize the entire system by that. Um, and also, again, I would just say that usually antisocial personality disorder is developed at an extremely young age before anyone's had any of those interactions with law enforcement. I've gotten a question, I've gotten a couple of questions that maybe don't specifically address your disagreements, but people are interested uh, in, uh, in this particular question uh, that I would put to you both. Um, what would, uh, since I've got you on screen, uh, Ra- Raphael, you'll start with, what would you, if you had your druthers, want to change about the criminal justice system? Uh, I'll uh, put that to you first, Raphael, and then Radley. Raphael, what would you change? Oh, man. Um, well, I, I would certainly change um, our system's propensity to uh, repeatedly release repeat uh, offenders who have proven themselves dangerous to society and have then gone on to victimize uh, their neighbors. Again, mostly black and brown Americans. I'm thinking here of a story of a woman named Brittany Hill in Chicago in 2018 who was standing outside at the age of 24 holding her one-year-old daughter. And she was talking to her baby's father when um, uh, a car drove up and the baby waved to the car actually just before the passenger window opened up and a a man stuck a gun out and opened fire, um, wounding Brittany Hill fatally as she shielded her daughter from gunfire at the age of one. And she collapsed in the street and she died with her daughter in her arms. And the, the, the shooting was captured on a Chicago Police Department camera. And so they were very quickly able to apprehend the suspects, one of whom uh, was a guy named Michael Washington, who had nine prior felony convictions, nine convictions, including for second degree murder, was on parole and pro- uh, at the time and, and out on bail on, on pending charges. Um, you know, I, I could go on for a really long time about things I would change about the criminal justice system, but the tragic stories of absolute carnage and destruction of families through violence that is uh, a result of our system's leniency on too many violent high rate offenders, um, to me, has to be at the top of the list. All right. Well, uh, since Raphael limited himself to one, Radley, uh, we're going to limit you to no more than two. What are two things that you change? Or one and a half things you change about the criminal justice system where you could go to two. Right. What, what, what would you change? So, there, there are a lot to choose from. But at first, I, I would re- dramatically reduce the policing footprint in this country. Um, I don't think we need um, police officers, for example, uh, uh, conducting or doing traffic enforcement. Uh, there are ways to do that uh, without armed uh, sort of agents of the state uh, confronting you for you know, running a stop sign or a red light. Um, I think uh, using police and traffic enforcement increases the number of contacts between police and, and particularly, again, in minority communities, increases the number of search, increases the number of opportunities for situations to escalate. Um, I think a lot of, of, of highway traffic enforcement could be done uh, in other ways, uh, including just sort of uh, engineering and road design. Uh, there have been some good, good examples uh, uh, in Europe that we could look to. Um, but then uh, the other thing I would change is I would, I would try to, and this is kind of more theoretical, I guess, but I, need, I think we need to think about why we have a criminal justice system and, and what it's designed to do. And I think, you know, switching from a retributive model to a more of a rehabilitation model uh, would go a long way. Um, again, we can look to Europe as examples where prisons are designed to rehabilitate people, um, not for just for to sort of um, uh, slake our thirst for retribution uh, out on people who commit crimes. Uh, certainly, there are some people who need to be um, uh, kept from society for the safety and benefit of society. 
but you know, as you, you touched on earlier, Gina, uh, there's there's lots of data showing that when people go to prison, um, it makes them uh, more violent when they come out than when they went in. That, that, that prison actually contributes to recidivism. Uh, we could change that model, and, and we could look, look to other countries that have successfully done that uh, and work to sort of rehabilitate people, work with people to to who, who commit crimes to um, you know improve their odds of succeeding when they get out, as opposed to right now, which um, you know, we, we make it very difficult for people to reenter society after they leave prison. Uh, and that's bad for them, but it's also bad for us. Um, and I think, I think changing sort of the way we look at what the system's for is important. Okay, okay. Well, uh, one final question. Uh, I, I'll put to you, Raphael, which has come through. Uh, Radley has said that many, at least many of the studies that he cited do control for higher rates of crime or control for similar kinds of crimes committed by blacks versus whites. And then you said that those controls uh, have not really been made. And you talked about increased the, the, the concentration of police uh, forces in high crime areas that are often black. Uh, could you, that seemed to be your explanation for the lack of control in these statistical studies. Uh, the audience is asking for you to clarify your position in that regard. No, I, I, well, I think I would I would disagree with the characterization of the studies that 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 Radley has has sort of collated as uh, largely uh, representing uh, pieces of literature that actually control for all the relevant factors. Like I said, I mean, I have not audited the entire article, but as uh, Radley was 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 giving his uh, rebuttal, I was able to go through the first nineteen. Uh, listed in his article, and and none of those uh, had uh, uh, anything approximating uh, the appropriate controls. Right? If, for example, a study uh, finds a, a sentencing disparity along racial lines that also controls for criminal history, that doesn't mean that criminal history is the only relevant control. Right? There are other factors like severity of the crime, for example. Right? Not all robberies are equal. You can you can do an armed robbery and no one gets hurt. You can do an armed robbery and and potentially shoot someone. Right? That you. It, it also doesn't necessarily reflect the actual charges that, that instituted the prosecution in the first place. Again, most of these cases are decided via plea bargain where charges are dropped or modified. Um, and, and so what people actually go to prison for does not necessarily represent um, you know, uh, what they did. And so to look at two robbery convictions as if the behavior was identical, I think, is, is the wrong way to look at it. Uh, can I respond to that? We ran out of, Radley, we ran out of time in the Q&A, but you have seven minutes. Uh, we're going to go to the final part. I want to take a few extra seconds to respond to what uh, Raphael said. You can do so. Uh, seven and a half minutes for your final summation, Radley. Would that be adequate? Take it away, Radley. Go ahead. Uh, sure. So I, I want to respond to what he just said because I, I find it hard to believe that uh, in the five minutes that I had for rebuttal, he went through the first 19 studies that I listed and was able to sort of pinpoint uh, where they failed to correctly uh, adjust for, you know, crime rates or, or, you know, geography or whatever else he thinks they need to adjust for. Uh, uh, that, that sort of strains uh, uh, <laughs> credulity in my mind. Um, one of those studies, in fact, was one, a study of 95 million traffic stops, uh, which found uh, basically that black people were more likely to be searched um, that they were less, the disparity actually lessened as it got darker, which suggests that police were unable to identify, less able to identify the race of the driver. Uh, race became less of a factor in who they pulled over and found out that police were more likely to search uh, black motorists despite the fact that searches of white people were more likely to turn up contraband. And that latter point, as I pointed out in my introduction, has, found, has been repeated over and over and over and over again in these studies. Uh, Raviel never sort of addressed why that would be. And that would seem to be a study that's pretty uh, indicative of, of uh, hard to sort of, um, I think, rebut because, uh, you know, if uh, it's true that, you know, black people are committing or were more likely to be carrying drugs or weapons, then maybe you could explain why they were more likely to be searched. But that's, uh, it's actually the, the opposite of that. Um, you know, I would just say in summary, uh, what, what you get when you when you debate uh, someone like Raphael or, or other people in Manhattan is they, they they tend to cherry pick a study or two or three or four that confirm what they have to say. And they write about it as if this is the only study that's ever been done on this matter. They don't acknowledge the fact uh, usually that there are dozens of studies that contradict uh, what that study uh, that just, just concluded. Uh, a good example is I did a Google trend search uh, last week on 
uh, the name uh, Roland Fryer, who's the, um, the the Harvard professor who did a study on police use of force and found that uh, while police officers were more likely to use force against black people, they were less likely to use lethal force. And this became sort of a, a very popular study for people on the right to cite and trying to contradict uh, the claim that black people were more likely to be killed by police. There are a lot of problems with that study. One, it relied on police reports um, on their own activities, which is always a problem and an inherent problem, I think, in some of this data. Uh, but also the, the, police, uh, the, the study on police force was limited to, to one city. But regardless of that, um, that was one study. Uh, there have been uh, multiple other studies since that one came out uh, that have come to the opposite conclusion or in various ways and that have tried to adjust for other factors. And I did a Google trend search uh, just the other day on this and found that on his name and then on the name of the lead researchers and uh, five other studies that have come out since his. Uh, and we're talking about right the, 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 the protests and, you know, this is very, um, uh, we're having sort of a moment for these issues. Uh, and citations to his study were, or excuse me, mentions of his study in Google searches far, you know, outnumbered searches for uh, the other five lead authors combined. Uh, and my point here is that, you know, it's easy to sort of generate attention to the one study that finds the, the you know, no racial disparity in some aspect of the criminal justice system uh, when, you know, literally you're, you're having dozens of studies coming to the opposite conclusion over and over again. It's the kind of what, what is news is that uh, dog bites man or man bites dog. Um, but, you know, I think it's important if you're going to make the point that you're going to sort of uh, buck the, 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 the tide on this, that you have to acknowledge uh, all of the, the data and literature that comes to the, uh, the opposite conclusion, and that's rarely done in these cases. Um, again, I would just say that, um, you know, when I started on this beat uh, with Reason Magazine in 2005, 2006, um, you know, I, I came from a pretty conservative background. I grew up in a, a very conservative county in Indiana, um, and I was very skeptical of claims that the criminal justice is inherent, inherently racist. I, I, I accepted that there were problems in it, systemic problems, and I think you know, that, that's still true. Uh, I think there are problems that affect white people and black people alike, but I think the problems disproportionately affect black people, and I think that is uh, by design because of the, system, the way the system was sort of uh, built and, and honed over the years. Um, you know, it was working on this beat. It was, uh, you know, seeing, uh, the, 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 doing the, the investigations that I've done. It was reading the research I've done. It was talking uh, to people in these communities, talking to law enforcement leaders. I mean, there are people within the law enforcement community, uh, black and white, uh, who will admit that the system uh, is a racist system and, it has, and that the, the racially disproportionate uh, outcomes are not the result of necessarily of inputs. It's partially the result of inputs, but it's also the product of the system itself. Um, I think the evidence is overwhelming. I would encourage people to go to the, the uh, Washington Post uh, page where I've accumulated these studies and sort of look through them. You can judge for yourself how well they adjust uh, for the things that Raphael thinks they need to adjust for. Um, you know, if you have a, a very sharp mind, I guess maybe you could audit 19 of them in five minutes. Um, but I think the evidence is overwhelming. Uh, and as I said, you know, I, I have included uh, studies that have come to opposite conclusions, at least to the extent that I found them. And I'm going to continue to update the list. Uh, but so far, you know, the ratio of, of, of studies that have found disparities to those haven't are about 25 to 1. Um, you know, I would just close by saying we, again, that the idea that we have a criminal justice system that is systemically racist uh, is not an indictment of everybody, of everybody who works within that system. And I think Raviello has been sort of willfully, um, uh, uh, I don't know, misstating what systemic racism actually means or sort of willfully um, uh, failing to acknowledge what the definition of it actually is. It is the, the, the acknowledgement that this is a system that was designed to produce very specific outcomes that... It was designed during an era where I think even Raphael would admit that uh, we had systemic racism in this country. We had we had legal uh, legally enforced segregation in this country, uh, and the idea that sort of just pulling away the the laws that that, that mandated segregation uh, and keeping the institutions that were alive and perpetuating and contributing to that uh, without significantly altering or changing them, um, you know, we should not be surprised that we have a system that produces uh, the outcomes that it has. All right, thank you, Radley. Uh, and uh, now, uh, Raphael, for your summation, take it away, Raphael. Yeah, well, I'll start by just kind of um, responding to uh, a few of the things. First off, I, what I went through are the first 19 characterizations of the study's findings by Radley, not the studies themselves. And all those characterizations were focused, again, on, uh, on disparities 
not just the presence of disparities. In, in other words, not actually uh, saying that these studies controlled for the relevant factors that isolated the role that racial animus played in producing those disparities. Um, I did also respond to uh, the evidence that he presented about likelihood of being searched, right? I offered evidence out of New York um, showing that the city council found uh, that black Americans were more likely to consent unwittingly, apparently, uh, to requests for uh, a search. And again, Roland Friars is not the only study that has failed to find um, uh, racism or evidence of racism in fatal police shootings. There was another study in, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, um, as well as, as, as several other shoot, don't shoot experiments. Um, and there's one that I wanna talk about really uh, quickly, which, which is interesting because it, it found that officers who, basically the study looked at, at, at gang unit officers, um, at regular police officers and then civilians, and it compared their performance in shoot, don't shoot experiments. Uh, and then it gave them uh, bias training. Uh, implicit bias training, and then it had them do uh, those experiments again and sort of compare the results. And, and what it found was that officers who routinely dealt with, uh, quote, stereotype congruent minority gang members uh, were actually less likely to exhibit differences in the racial breakdowns of their shoot, don't shoot decisions after bias training. Um, and this supports the hypothesis that uh, race may actually be taken as a diagnostic cue in the field by police officers, um, uh, at, at least in in those simulations um, because, quote, their on-the-job experience with gang members and street crime creates a stereotype congruent environment that allows them to rely more heavily on heuristics. Um, and, and people should be troubling by, troubled by that. But again, uh, the, the question is, is whether they're relying on heuristics out of racial animus or out of a desire um, to suss out crime. And what that study found was that um, the gang police officers actually showed no evidence of racial bias in their ultimate decisions to shoot. Um, they were just as equally uh, likely to shoot across racial groups. And the gang unit cops specifically outperformed comparison groups in detecting guns and were overall the least likely to shoot suspects. Um, you know, again, I, I, I think ultimately, uh, you know, a, a big chunk of, of our difference here is that I reject Radley's definition of systemic racism. I think we have to show and establish that there is, is, is an intent here. Um, and again, for, for all the reasons I, I stated earlier, I don't think um, that we can find intent, um, you know, uh, for, for disparities, uh, you know, cannot be conflated uh, with racism. There, we have to actually control for the relevant factors to isolate the role that racism might be playing. Um, you know, the, the reality is, is again, um, the criminal justice system has more than just enforcement outputs and every operator of the criminal justice system at least claims to want to bring about crime declines and applauds when those crime declines happen. And the fact that those crime declines and you're primarily to the benefit of black and brown Americans, I think drastically undermines the claim, uh, that Radley's defending here. Um, again, the system has been incredibly responsive to calls for reform, which are often rooted in, in the idea of combating uh, systemic racism and the idea of anti-racism, right? We have uh, evidence just recently, uh, again, out of New York, we've got you know, Governor Cuomo signing 10 laws, uh, you know, just, just weeks after uh, uh, George Floyd uh, was, was unjustly killed, right? And, and we've got just plenty of, I mean, that, that's not the, fir the first or only thing that we've done. We've seen a wave of progressive prosecutors elected across the country. Um, we've seen prosecutors' offices, you know, shift to supporting parole, um, we've seen them declining to prosecute more minor offenses. Um, we've, we've seen here in New York, the passage and, and signing of the Right to Know Act. We've seen the closing of Rikers Island. We've seen the cut in, in jail admissions and, and state level incarceration. Um, we've seen bail reform, discovery reform, uh, raise the age. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that a system uh, apparently uh, dedicated to the uh, oppression of black and brown Americans would not be so responsive to their calls for reform. And I think the fact that it is, uh, is, is another uh, point that just undermines the, the claim that Radley's defending here. Um, he also, again, ignores, uh, I, I think, fails to have a really good explanation for the role that black and, and brown Americans play in, in apparently perpetuating racism. Um, uh, and, and the reason that he's able to do that is because he puts intent off to the side, um, which I don't think we can do. This is a very serious charge, and I don't think we can just attach some flimsy definition to a term uh, that says amorphous is systemic racism and, and allow people to get away with that because it does have very real consequences, right? People will call 911 less. People will be 
more likely to try and handle disputes on their own, which could lead to more neighborhood violence. This is not a benign narrative. Um, and, you know, uh, to the extent that it, it's being used, uh, you know, to, to perpetuate more depolicing and decarceration, I would point to uh, evidence out of Chicago just in recent weeks. Right. While police were busy handling riots in, in other parts of the cities, the weekend of May 31st, Chicago experienced its most violent weekend of the year. Is that a coincidence? I mean, May 31st was the single most violent day in Chicago's history since, 2000, since, since 1961 when it, when it started uh, keeping track. I don't think that's a coincidence. And again, um, the idea that defenders of the criminal justice system consistently, as I do, as Heather McDonald does, as, as police leaders across the country do, argue that it's black lives that are going to be saved by the crime declines uh, attributable to the policies that they support, I think, again, just shows that there is absolutely no intent to produce racially disparate outcomes for its own sake. The reality is, is that many of the disparities that we see, though not all, are attributable to differences in crime commission and, and, and are, are functions of, of a mission that is essentially noble at its core. And um, I think, you know, that, that's something we all have to remember. And I'll, I'll close there. Okay. Well, thank you, Raphael. Thank you, Radley, for a very lively and informative debate exchange. Jane, please open the final vote on the resolution. Uh, many of you have not seen this live stream and will and have cast an initial vote. And so we're going to give you a chance, uh, those who have not seen the live stream but will be watching the video and the audio, we'll be giving you a chance to watch the video and audio once it's released this Friday. And we'll be giving you a few days to decide on your final vote. Uh, the results will be announced next week. Uh, thanks to all of you for watching. We'll certainly have more online debates like these. In a few weeks, we will have a debate on the presidential election. Uh, but I hope that will be online. But I hope to see all of you at our physical space at the Subculture Theater in the not too distant future. Good night and thanks.